Happy Sabbath, church family. Did you enjoy the music? I sure did. That was beautiful music. And I'm very excited about the uh, shoebox project. I came home and there were bags of toys. And I was like, man, do we adopt a child? What happened? Where did all these toys come from? But um, it was for the shoebox project. So we're happy to participate. Um, and I pray God's blessings on every box that leaves here. Amen. Um, that it would reach the right child and, um, and do something powerful for them spiritually as well as in just giving them some enjoyment. Um, we're going to get right into our word. I know we're a little, little later than we normally start, so we're going to get jump right in. We have a, um, uh, our eighth installment in our sanctuary series. Um, our scripture reading, as Donnie so well read it, Psalms 141. 141st division of the book of Psalms. David says, Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice. When I cry unto thee, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. A message this Sabbath is entitled uh, Sanctuary Part 8, The Smoke of Spiritual Warfare. The Smoke of Spiritual Warfare. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word once again. I ask now, Lord, that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord, but upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard, Lord. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we're going to jump right in. Our, uh, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare today and prayer. And this is going to be a little different style than normally I present these because, um, one, of all of the pieces of furniture in the sanctuary, the one we're going to study today is my favorite. It's a very important piece of furniture, but also because it touches on prayer. And if you don't understand prayer and its power, you will never be a good Christian. Prayer is our lifeline. And so we're going to talk about prayer today. Psalm 77. And why are we studying the sanctuary? Psalm 77, 12 and 13. I will meditate also of all thy work. And talk of your doings. Verse 13, thy way, O God, is where? It's in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? To understand God, his relationship to us, and how God moves and works, we study the sanctuary. Something that a lot of Christians don't study, a lot of people in the world know nothing about. We've been talking about it. We talked about the height of the fence on the outside being about seven and a half feet. You couldn't just look into the courtyard. You had to enter in through the gates here with praises and thanksgiving. The first article you would see is here. And of course, here's the tabernacle. This represents the cloud that they would follow by day and all the hosts of Israel. The 12 tribes would surround the sanctuary. We've gone through the pieces of furniture. We started with the brazen altar where the daily sacrifice was made, where the fire from God was placed and it is an important fire, a fire that was never to go out. We also talked about the brazen laver, where they would wash, the priests would wash before they went in. The altar represents the cross and crucifixion of Christ. But the laver represents his death, burial, and resurrection, which is also represented in baptism. Amen? So the courtyard represents Christ's life, what Christ gave for us and left with us. But as Christians, one thing we studied is that we are not to stay in the sanctuary, in the, in, the, in the courtyard. We must move from the courtyard into the holy place because we have been called not just to be uh, Christians, but to be priests. In fact, in the first chapter of Revelation, it says we are called to be kings and priests with Christ. So we don't just, we don't just get saved. We, we go into the holy place and we begin to participate in what goes on. So we talked about the candlesticks and um, being the light of the world uh, and representing Jesus, who is the light of this world and the light that we each should shine. It was, a, one of the, it was the only object here that is made of solid gold, 
not acacia wood covered with gold. Then we had the table of showbread. And how often was the bread replaced? Do you remember? Once a week. Um, there was a certain group that made the bread and the bread was replaced. And on Sabbath, they would have fresh loaves of bread. And of course, today we're going to talk about the altar of incense. And here, of course, next time we'll talk about the Ark of the Covenant. And so when we, we peel it open and you look inside the sanctuary, it would look like this. And here's the golden candlesticks, the table of showbread. And today we're going to talk about the altar of incense, which um, you can describe, because if you don't count all of the branches of the golden candlestick, as the tallest of all of the pieces of furniture um, in the holy place. And this is that artist rendition we saw with all the walls of gold. And remember, the soffits here were silver, which represented the fact that we must be purified, speaks to our character, that we each will go through fire. And we will be purified that way. Silver represents the fact that we must be purified. God is represented by the purity that comes from the pure gold that lined the uh, holy place. And remember, the only light they had, there were no windows, came from the candlesticks. And so it, was, it would have been an incredible thing to step in there. All five of your senses would be evoked. Taste, right? You, they, the priest ate the bread. Smell, because you would also smell the bread. Sight in the candlesticks. But bread also represents the word, which incorporates the hearing of the word, but also would go with the prayers of the priests. And of course, an interesting one is um, to come back around to is smell. Because what they put on the um, altar of incense had everything to do with the power that comes with smell. We'll talk more about that, all right? So as we move, we look at the altar of incense. I'm going to describe it, um, and then we're going to do some application. And so you can see here the priest would come twice a day before the altar of incense, and he would take the coals could only come from off the brazen altar. No other fire could be put here. The, and we'll talk about how important that it was that even the um, incense was made a specific way. So specific that if you uh, made bootleg incense. Yeah, I know they make bootleg cologne. Um, smells like Calvin Klein, but not quite, right? Um, you couldn't make fake incense and burn because if you did, you would be cut off. The only place you could get this scent was in the holy place. It was that important. So how did they, they, how they build this one? Exodus 30 and verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. And a cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares, a perfect square, shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. The horns have significance. Remember, Horns represent power. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, around about, and the, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. So there was a crown that went around it, horns that came off of it, so that nothing would fall off. But the crown also represents the fact that prayer was a part of connecting to God's royalty. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear with all. So they'd, they'd make these rings on the side. You'd put a beam of wood, a little um, a stave through it, so that when they carried it, they, they could carry it that way. They had less than the other articles of furniture because this is a smaller piece of furniture. Verse 5, and thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. This, watch this, it was here that God met with the priest every single day. It was at the altar of incense twice a day. In fact, so important is the altar of incense that it is not actually considered an article of furniture of the holy place. It is considered an article of furniture of the most holy place. And Aaron shall burn thereupon sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighted the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense thereon, 
nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. It was not for the remission of sin. It wasn't like the other altar. This one was special. Its purpose was prayer. But there were times, verse 10, and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonements, once in the year shall he make the atonement upon it throughout the generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Once a year, blood would be put on the horns and as so that uh, on the day of atonement, this is so that because huh, even in our prayer life, we can sin. So blood was applied even to the altar. It covered the priest, the altar of incense. It covered the priests and the prayers of Israel. Every time the priest went in to deal with the altar of incense, the people would gather around. If you look at Luke chapter one. Um, uh, when, when the priest in, 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 uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus was there, they, the people gathered to pray while the priest was dealing with the incense and the altar of incense. That tells you that you should at least have two times a day that you have meaningful prayer to God. That is the biblical model, at least twice a day. That means in the morning, you should have a prayer before you go out. And in the evening, you should have a prayer. And I don't mean, you know, a brief little Lord, I'm, it's time for me to sleep. Bless me while I sleep. I mean, a time you spend in prayer. We're going to talk more about that. There is a lack of prayer in our church and in our churches. Um, <coughs> I tell this all the time, but I, I, I forget, I'll never forget when I was in London, England, and I was, I was speaking for the local conference. I was speaking for one of the churches, and... Um, they took me to the conference office and the union office, and one of the pastors, he said to me, he said, um, in London, England, for every Christian pastor, there are 30 witches. Numerically, the pastors are outnumbered 30 to 1, is what he told me. I didn't, I didn't do Google search to try and verify this. I believed him at his word. But he said, and he said, what is frightening isn't that they're they're, that the witches outnumber the pastors by so much. He said, is that on the weekends, we know that the witches are up all night long praying to the dark forces for the destruction and dismantling of the Christian churches. They spend their night in prayer to our enemy that our churches will not succeed. That our missions will not succeed. That the shoeboxes will not succeed. That our marriages will not succeed. That our children will be corrupted. They spend all night in prayer warring, spiritually warring against us. And here's what's frightening, church. Some of us don't spend 30 seconds in prayer. The enemy is praying for our destruction. My grandmother, Olga Clark, was a faithful Christian lady. And in Jamaica, she, when she, when, you know, Sabbath afternoon, she would gather us around and tell us stories about her, you know, her living in Jamaica and her, and dealing with, 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 with what she called the Obia ladies. And she would tell us stories of how they would plot her destruction and pray against her. And my mother and my Aunt Doreen would tell us stories of how they would gather in a room and pray as there were people outside praying for their destruction because she was the only Sabbath-keeping Christian. And they would pray for the destruction of their family. And my grandmother would pray. And when, my, when the family would pray, the protection that would come. One night, all night, this was happening against my grandmother's house. And my mother and my Aunt Doreen confirmed the story to me one Sabbath that they, would, they could hear horses running outside the house, running around the house. But when they looked outside, there, were, there, were nothing, there was nothing moving. No one was out there. They could even hear the horses running above the house after a while. And they prayed. My grandmother and my, and my aunts and uncles and my mom, they prayed all night. My grandfather drove trucks, so he wasn't there. And the next day, my grandmother was, was, was putting clothes out on the line, and my grandmother tells me that one of the women that was praying against them came to her and asked her in the Patwa dialect, Uman awekana obia, you working. In other words, what, are you, what magic are you doing? And the woman said, all we did all night did nothing. In fact, it's as if everything we wished evil on you fell on us. 
My grandmother was happy to share with her that while they were playing, pray, praying to the spirits of darkness, she was praying to the Most High God. I want to submit to you that there are things happening in your life that are not changing and are not moving. There are folk in your circle who you want to pray for, who you want them to find God uh, or, or to be reconciled to Christ. And it's not happening. And partly it's because we are not sometimes we are not taking our prayer life seriously as interceders for others. This piece of furniture represents the importance of intercessory prayer. So it was made of wood like the other ones, covered in gold. The horns represent the power of prayer. Um, special incense was used, all the things we just mentioned. In fact, it even describes this. Exodus 30 and verse 34 describes the incense. And the Lord said unto Moses, take unto these sweet spices, Stacte and Onca and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall be their like weights with equal parts. One of them actually came from a shell fish type of thing that they found locally. And they would mix them in equal parts. And now watch this. And thou shalt make it a what? A perfume. A confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. You are supposed to make this a sweet savor. And our sister introduced me to some, some um, um, uh, oils and aromatherapies. And I haven't gotten through all of the articles she sent me. But I started to realize there's healing in smell. What we smell matters. Oh, y'all missing this thing. When they, would, when they would put this thing on the altar of incense and burn it twice a day, it would fill the holy place with the scent and the smoke that would come from this incense. It was a sweet smell. Here's where it gets powerful. It would go up and over the veil that led into the most holy place. And so they were able to directly communicate with the most holy place by the smell and the smoke that came off of the altar of incense. And that's how prayer works. So we're going to find out. It was pure and holy. In fact, the smell would get so powerful when you read about this that it would sometimes waif out of the holy place and into the courtyard and beyond. And huh, because it was always burning, every time you walked near the sanctuary, you would smell the incense burning and be reminded to pray. This is why Paul says, Paul doesn't just in a vacuum say, pray without ceasing, pray continually. He's saying that as, as, it, as it reflects back to the sanctuary, because in the sanctuary, the scent of prayer was always coming out. I want you to have the kind of mindset when you're at work and your boss gets on your last nerve. But you smell the incense. They cut you off in traffic. Smell the incense. Turn to a mind of prayer rather than one of anger. Exodus 30 and verse 36, and thou shalt beat some of it very small and put it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with you. It shall be unto you most holy. This is the power of prayer we're talking about now. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according uh, to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. You can't make, you can't bootleg this. You can't make your own batch and take it home. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. That means your prayers belong to God and nothing and no one else. Some of us hope to our jobs. We hope to our neighbors. We hope to our circle of friends. Huh. No, our hope is in Christ Jesus. Priests would stand there. And he would minister. And the prayers of all Israel would go up. They would go up over the veil that separated them from God. And the prayers would come down in the holy place and sit on the mercy seat where the Shekinah glory of God would fall. It was a powerful symbolism for the people of God as it is for us today that we are to be a praying people if we're going to fight in the spiritual warfare of this day. You got to learn to call on the name of the Lord. 
Patriarchs and Prophets, page 353 says, In the offering of incense, the priest was brought more directly into the presence of God than in any other act of the daily ministration. As the inner veil of the sanctuary did not extend to the top of the building, the glory of God, which was manifested above the mercy seat, was partially visible from the first apartment. When the priest offered incense before the Lord, he looked toward the ark, and as the cloud of incense arose, the divine glory descended upon the mercy seat and filled the most holy place, and often so filled both apartments that the priest was obliged to retire to the door of the tabernacle. As in the typical service, the priest looked by faith to the mercy seat, which he could not see. So the people of God are now to direct their prayers to Christ, their great high priest, who, unseen by human vision, is pleading in their behalf in the sanctuary above. Right now, Christ is pleading on your behalf, on my behalf. And guess what? It's our, our duty to do the same. So the fire could only come from the brazen altar. We mentioned that. Incense renewed with the lighting of the candles twice a day. No sacrifice was to be made except um, uh, once a year, blood could be put on the horns. The SDA Bible commentary says this, the fact that the altar was before the mercy seat teaches us that prayer brings us into the presence of God. Although the veil of humanity, see 1 Corinthians 13, 12, prevents our physical eyes from seeing God, don't miss this church, pre prevents our physical eyes from seeing God, faith and prayer are able to go where the body cannot. I want to submit to you that when you kneel down at your bedside at night, and you call on the name of the Lord, you are ushered into the presence of Almighty God. That should change the way you view prayer. You see, the reason prayer is so important to God, it isn't that he doesn't know what you need or who you want to pray for. It is important to God because it is through communication that relationships are built. You can't have a relationship with someone you don't communicate with. Stop. If you don't communicate with your spouse or your child, your, your relationship will, uh, 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 all by itself, it will begin to devolve. God wants you communicating him with him because he wants to be in relationship with you. That's what prayer does. Prayer allows us to be in relationship with God. He knows what you need before you pray. Prayer allows us to recognize that he has all the answers. Look at what Revelation, Revelation 5, 8 says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors. That's the same golden vials that they would take from the, from the brazen altar and, and walk into the holy place, which are the what? The prayers of the saints. Revelation 8, 3 and 4 says it like this. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. When you pray, church, it ascends out of the angel's hands into the throne room of God. Some things that come only, Jesus says, by prayer and fasting. Some things will only move that way. There's a miracle you need. There's a blessing you want. And, and, and preferentially, it's a blessing or, or a miracle you want for someone else. Prayer is the key, and the hand of faith that unlocks the doors to, treasure, to heaven's treasure house. Prayer does that. So how do we pray? Well, the lessons we get of prayer is, number one, we don't pray self-righteous prayers, especially when we're trying to intercede for someone else. We do not pray as if we've got it all together and everyone else is messed up. We'll see an example of that in a second. Before we pray, we ask for cleansing. So in the beginning of our prayers, we should ask for the forgiveness of sin. 
We ask for God to wash us like the laver. We wash before we enter the holy place. In our prayer sequence, it's praise and thanksgiving. When you went to the gate, it's to ask for forgiveness as you do in the courtyard. And as you move in, you pray based on the Bible promises, which are represented by the table of showbread, because that's God's word. When you pray, you should, in your prayer, put God's promises. I say all the time when I pray, God, you said in your word, in the book of Isaiah, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Lord, you said that. And I believe you. You're going to deliver me out of this affliction. You're going to uh, deliver my cousin out of this affliction. You're going to deliver my neighbor out of this affliction. Lord, you're going to do it because you said you would. You always pray for others before you pray for yourself. Amen? This is intercessory prayer. We pray for others before we pray for ourselves. We lift up. We should have a prayer list of people we pray for. My list gets so long sometimes, I just got to say, Lord, pray for, I'm praying for everybody on the list. I've seen miracles happen through prayer. That's what David says here, Psalm 66, 18 through 20. David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. What if you're dealing with a sin issue? Ask God for forgiveness. Take it to him in contrition. Understand that you're going to struggle with this thing. But do not pray and hold on to your sin as if God was, is going to bless you in your sin. You've got to say, Lord, I, can't, I like what I'm doing. I'm stuck in this sin. But Lord, deliver me from it. Wash me in your blood. Sometimes the secret to gaining victory over sin is to admit to God just how much of a, a stronghold that thing has on you. Some of us want to pretend we've got it all together. Jesus is sitting there waiting for you to tap out so he can come in and do the job. Prayer, the book of prayer by Ellen White, page 244. Let us strive to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed not only for himself, watch this church, but for those who were opposing him. When he felt earnestly desirous that the souls that had trespassed against him might be helped, he himself received help. Did you know God will bless you when you pray for the folk who have done you wrong? Some of our prayers are not answered. Because we're holding grudges against people. We're angry with people. And instead of praying for them, we're hoping the worst thing possible happens to them. The power in praying for those who have done you wrong. Let us pray not only for ourselves, but for those who have hurt us and are continuing to hurt us. Pray, pray, especially in your mind. Give not the Lord rest, for his ears are upon are open to, to hear sincere, important prayers when the soul is humbled before him. He will hear the consistent prayers. When we pray consistently, God will hear. I remember when I was going through one of the darkest times in my life when I was in Pasadena, California, and the whole world had exploded around me. and huh, it, it, was, it was a horrible time. Local papers, the local TV stations, I was on everything. I was in government for the city, and, and my world turned upside down. It was a time of trouble like I had never seen before nor since. And I remember I was laying on my face. You hear my testimony, I say this. I was laying on my face in my house, calling on God, and I could feel like a demonic weight on my back. Like pressure sitting on me. And I was calling on God's name. I had a Bible open in front of me, reading the Psalms. You see, when I get in trouble, I go to three Ps. Prayer, the Psalms, and praise. You do those three, three things when you have trouble, and you'll be amazed at how quickly your mind will, will your in atmosphere of your mind will change. And I'm, I'm reading the Psalms, and all of a sudden, as I'm, as I'm laying there, I could feel the weight of what was happening, lift from off of me. And I remember praying and asking God, God, what happened? How come the weight 
that I felt that pressed me so hard? Why has it lifted? And it was like God spoke to me and he said, someone is praying for you. And every now and again, I would feel the weight lift and I would realize that folk were praying for me. And sure enough, to, to, um, to, to confirm that, I started getting the emails of all the people saying, listen, we're praying for you. Our church is praying for you. This, and I started to realize there's power. There's power when we pray for one another. So powerful that one of the great stories in the Bible of prayer are found in Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashesaris, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the numbers of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So Daniel miraculously survives the fall of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is no longer around. His great, his great grandson, Belshazzar, is gone. And now the Medo-Persian Empire takes over and Darius elevates Daniel. This is a miracle. Normally they would kill everybody from the previous kingdom. Daniel realizes that the 70-year prophecy Jeremiah gives for the time for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem, the sanctuary to be restored, is almost up. But he does not see that his people have changed much. In fact, their time in Babylon seems to have corrupted his people even further, many of them. So he goes to pray for them. Look at verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. The fact that he says that he prays with fasting means Daniel prayed for at least one day. Because he wouldn't fast for an hour or two. He was fasting for a time. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. The word dreadful there can also be uh, tr uh, translated awe-inspiring. Keeping the covenant and mercy upon them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. Look at how, remember, it's not self-righteous. He says, we have sinned. Daniel wasn't a part of the mess they were doing. But he says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off. Through all the countries, whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. Daniel again accepts the consequences of breaking God's law. He says, O Lord, to us belongs confusion of face. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers. Why? Because we have sinned against thee. Daniel puts down one of the most powerful prayers ever recorded. In Daniel 9 and verse 17, he says, Now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations. Look at verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. Why do we pray? It says, defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God. For the city and thy people are called by thy name. Well, Daniel Tell tells us that while he was praying his prayer, he had to delay. And the delay came because as the angel Gabriel was coming to give him the answer, he was met by the enemy. Daniel 10, 12, then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day you did pray, set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. Look at verse 13. You wonder why sometimes it's hard for our prayers to be heard or feel like they don't get answered? Verse 13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Who is that? That is Satan himself withstood me one, on, one in 20 days, 21 days, but lo, Michael 
One of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Daniel only wanted to know if the 70-year prophecy was going to be fulfilled and they could go back. When he prays, Gabriel has an even more special message for him. And as he's on his way, he meets Satan and must fight him. It is the archangel Michael who is who? Jesus himself comes to fight and contend with Satan so that Gabriel can get the message through. Why am I telling you this? Because you cannot stop praying when you think you have not heard an answer. Angels are dispatched when you pray. And the enemy dispatches his demons, his minions, to try and stop your prayers from reaching where they're supposed to reach, from being answered the way they're supposed to be answered. That means you don't get weary in praying. You stay and you pray, church. Understanding that this is spiritual warfare. Uh, the devil wants your destruction, the destruction of your home, of your family, of your children. He wants you to lose out on eternity. Every time you bow and pray, the devil gets nervous because he understands that when we pray, we have the entire heavenly host who can respond. Hmm. Let me tell you something. I remember I was, um, my cousin Leon and I had gone, we were, it was one summer here and we were in, we were, we told my aunt Sheila, I was staying up here with my mother that already moved to Miami. And I was staying at Aunt Sheila's house, and we were, um, Leon would decide we are going to go to a barbecue at somebody's house in Windsor. And so, you know, two teenage boys, we drive over to Windsor to this barbecue. And his mother somehow warned us, and I don't know why she did, because it wasn't in the cards. She told us before we left the house, do not go to the movies. I don't know why she told us that, because we weren't going to a barbecue, not the movies. But when we got to the barbecue, guess where they wanted to go? The movies. I don't remember what movie it was. But his mother told us not to go. Now, I was a passenger, so wherever the car went, I was going to go. But it's not like I put up a fight either. I have to be honest. I was okay going to the movies. I grew up, we couldn't go to the movies. So I was ready to go to the movies. And so we, we go to the movies and we see some movies. And there's hardly anybody in the movies. There's an old movie theater in East Hartford. I think they done tore it down now. And we are there, and there's a gang that was the only other group. So there's about 10 of us from Bloomfield and Windsor, two car loads. One, came from, one from Bloomfield, one from Windsor. And this gang in the back of the movie theater. They were called, at the time, the Park Street Posse. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't, but that's all right. And so, you know, the movie's supposed to be quiet. Everybody's making noise, and, you know, stuff is happening. When we go to leave, talking about prayer now. When we go to leave, the car split. The group from Windsor go to Windsor without any uh, problems. The group going to Bloomfield, we drive past. There's five of us deep in the car. I was in the middle of the back seat. We drive past one of the cars from this group. And um, I don't know what happened. I don't know who looked at who the wrong way. Somebody gave the other one some hand gestures that are not appropriate. And... One of the, my friend who was driving the car stops and asks, do they want trouble? He, he really says, do they want to get busy? Now, we saw one car, but inherent in the word posse is a lot of people. I know some of y'all don't know that about that stuff, but that's what it means. And so we stop, and the, 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 my, my friend who was sitting in the front seat, passenger side, he jumps out to start fighting. I'll never forget it like it was yesterday. And quickly, they start fighting. Then another one of my friends was sitting to the left of me. I won't say anybody's name. He gets out, and this guy was fast. And I don't know what he was thinking, but he just took off running. <laughs> I mean, that brother ran so fast, he would have won an Olympic gold medal in the 100-yard dash if he was. He took off running. He ran so fast, he told us later, he got so far ahead of them that he was able to hide in a bush and watch them run past the bush. But I left the driver, me in the middle back seat, and my cousin Leon to the right of me. And as we were about to get out to help the one friend who was there fighting, the guy driving said, this is my father's car, and took off. He didn't want anything to happen to his father's car. 
Well, he should have thought about that before he thought he could fight. Or we should say anything. He, I remember him jumping the curve and hitting one of the other the people from the other side. And jumping the curve and driving. And I'll never forget as they, now one car turned into like seven cars. And I remember we drove past one of the cars and they were, they had, um, went into the trunk and, and I could see the dude putting together a gun. Based on later life experience, that was a semi-automatic weapon. And I'll never forget, we got into a car chase just like Hollywood. Busting red lights, making illegal turns, high speed. I was, the whole time I was like, you know, I always see the police. Eh, it was funny that we don't see any police right now. <laughs> and finally we bust a red light that they could not follow us through. And we get away. And we go to the friend who was fighting. We go back, first we loop back around to the theater, pick up the guy who ran so fast that he got away. He was covered in dirt because he was hiding in the bushes. But he was safe. And we went to the one friend who got out to Fight's house and he, was, he had been pulverized. Never forget it. Hulk just swollen. Looked like he fought, fought Mike Tyson in his prime. And we were depressed and distraught. I'll never forget when we got back home, my Aunt Sheila was sitting on the couch. And the whole time we were gone, church, you know what she was doing? Praying. That story always meant a lot to me because I realized that night I could have died. Somebody could have shot a gun and straight bullets, bad aim, whatever, or, or good aim, could have taken me out. I remember years later doing trauma surgery at the University of Miami when I was in medical school, doing my trauma surgery rotation, and in one Saturday night in Miami, 14 men came in shot. Three of them died in one night in Miami. And I'll never forget, most of them had no beef with anybody. They just happened to be in the wrong place around them. Every one of them was black. Some Latino black, some Jamaican black, some American black. Fourteen. And I reflected that night, that the night years earlier, when my aunt was praying for me, I could have simply been another statistic. I, I, I tell you this because we don't understand the power that God has when we pray. He can deflect bullets. He can cause the enemy's tire to go out. You serve a God who can put a hedge around you. Amen. And when we pray for others, church, I'll never forget that night how my heart raced. Not knowing what would happen if we crashed. Because I was more afraid of the driving after a while than I was of the guns. This is what the spirit of prophecy says. Prayer, page 246. Begin to pray for souls. Come near to Christ, close to his bleeding side. Let a meek and quiet spirit adorn your lives. And let your earnest, broken, humble petitions ascend to him for wisdom that you may have success in saving not only your own soul, but the souls of others. There are souls who have lost their courage Speak to them. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them the word of God. There is a soul sickness no bomb can reach, no medicine heal. Pray for these and bring them to Jesus Christ. And in all your work, Christ will be present to make impressions upon human hearts. It's not your job to save other folk. It is to invite Christ to do the saving. Have you ever read Roger Minot's story and read his books on the incredible answers to prayer and so forth? One of the things he says that's profound is that because of the way the great controversy is set up, like the story of Job, what the devil does when we say, you know what, I want to pray for this person, uh, you know, we see someone who's in need of prayer, the devil will go to, basically, in the way the framework of the great controversy, an allegory, I'll say it. The devil will go to God and basically say, listen, you can't help this person. They're not asking for help. They're not praying to you for help. So you can't help this drug addicted person, this, this broken person, this wounded person. You can't help that person stuck in sin because they're not asking for your help. God, it's not fair. You can't help them. 
But guess what happens when we pray for them? It is like we give God permission to work for a person who does not even know to call on the name of God. You know, that's how I pray for some folks sometimes. Lord, I give you permission to go in and work on behalf of that individual. I give you permission, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to penetrate their heart, to break their drug addiction problem, Lord. To break them from out of whatever it is that has them so uh, easily bound up. Lord, I give you permission. That's why we pray the way we pray, church. That's why there's that section in the bulletin about prayer. Because the, the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man does what? It availeth much. I want to give you, in closing, an update on my cousin Devon, who was hospitalized um, and intubated with COVID. He's out of the hospital. He's home. And remember I told you his kidneys had failed and he was on dialysis? His kidneys fully recovered. His lungs seemed to, matter of fact, the last time I spoke to him, Devon told me he's ready to start working out again. I said, okay, slow your roll there, brother. Slow your roll. I sent him some vegan protein shakes. I said, drink some of those a few days first. But Devon was telling the family in our last Zoom call his testimony. Devon said that when he woke up in the hospital, he thought he'd been in a car accident. He had no idea how he was intubated or under. He had no idea COVID had done it. He said that he couldn't talk because the tube was in. But he remembers, and his wife verifies this, that he, they were basically told by the doctor and the nurses that there was no hope. There was no hope. And as his condition worsened, at my, in my talking to the nurses when I called the hospital, it seemed as if they truly had begun to give up hope at times. From a, from, a, from a care standpoint. But his condition worsened. He says, however, that there were nights when he was laying, don't miss this church, when he was laying in his hospital bed in the intensive care unit there in Florida, there were nights, he says, that all of a sudden it was as if the whole family was in the room with him. And it was like he could, he, was, he said there were nights he would have conversations with his father. And he said one night it was like all of us, his cousins, everyone was in the room and he was trying to talk to us. And the nurse would run in and tell him, stop, you, you know, stop trying to talk. And when we started to look at it, don't miss this church, the times when we were having some of those Zoom meetings, when we were interceding in prayer on his behalf, Devon got the impression that we were in the room with him. Ah, the smoke of the incense went up over the veil, somebody, and came down on the mercy seat, and Devon ha, spiritually could sense that we were calling on the name of the Lord for on his behalf. He says that at nights there were nurses. We were talking about some of the nurses we didn't like. He said that there were nights when there were nurses who would slip into his room quietly, hold his hand as he was intubated, and he could hear the nurses calling on the name of Jesus for his recovery. When he finally woke up and they extubated him, they said, well, you might be on, you know, they were, you know, the risk of dialysis being long term and all of this kind of stuff. When I talked to when I talked to him and when I talked to them, I said, he's not going to be on dialysis because one of the nights after that Zoom call, after one of our Zoom calls, as I was looking at the faces of my family and missing my family. And I, I started to cry because our family has had a lot of loss. A lot of people in our family have passed away prematurely. And I sat at my desk in my in my office in the basement of our house and I began to agonize with God by myself after the Zoom call. And I said, Lord, he cannot die. I said, Lord, I claim the promises of scripture that there is a bomb in Gilead, that you are a healer of the sick. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ on my cousin. And I said, I don't claim the blood of Jesus for the sake of Devon only. But Lord, I want my family to know and see that the God of heaven is a real God. 
I want them to know we don't worship some fairy tale God. This is not a make-believe story. I want after they have been told that there's no hope of his recovery, I want them to see not only that he walks out of this hospital, I want him to walk out of this hospital, not on dialysis, with no lung problems, fully recovered from everything that happened. And church, guess what? God did it. In fact, the doctor, who I don't even believe is a believer, came to my cousin Devon and you know what the doctor said? I was praying for you too. He said, you are the only person that we've ever intubated in this hospital with COVID. You're the only one that's going to walk out of here alive. That's why they didn't believe he'd ever leave the hospital. Let me tell you something, church. You serve a God of power. When the spiritual warfare begins, when the enemy comes against your family, when they come against your children, when they come against your marriage, when they come against your home, I am challenging you today to lift up a prayer, to stand before the altar of incense, to burn that pure incense of a humble spirit, of a broken spirit, of a contrite spirit, and let the sweet savor of our prayers rise to the mercy seat of God Almighty. And I challenge you, church, Things will turn around in your life. Things will turn around in your home. Things will turn around for your children. Pray without ceasing. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the altar of incense and what it means. But Father God, we are to be a praying people, continually praying, always allowing the smoke of our prayers to ascend heavenward and land on the mercy seat, Lord, where you are happy to step in and answer our prayers. Father God, you don't even always answer them the way that we want, but you always answer them the right way. Father God, give us faith to trust you in prayer. As the father of the demoniac boy said, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to be a people who pray. And help us, Lord, to be a people who believe. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen. Take time to be holy. Let us all stand.
bow your heads for the benediction. Now, Father God, as we leave this place, let us not leave your presence. We pray that this week, Lord, we would send up the sweet smell of the incense of our prayers. Father God, I pray that each one of us would have a prayer list. Lord, we'd be lifting up the names of others to you. Lord, you would intercede on their behalf. Father God, help us to be a praying people, a believing people. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.